San Francisco is falling apart. Tents, drugs, trash, and overdoses are everywhere. The city is home to more than 18,000 homeless, including 4,000 who suffer from homelessness, addiction, and mental illness simultaneously. The city government spends more than $1 billion a year on homelessness, but it's worse than ever. I'm here to find out what happened. I want to know how one of the world's richest cities turned out like this. This is Golden Gate and Hyde in San Francisco's Tenderloin District. It's a West Coast's largest open-air drug market with street gangs dealing heroin, fentanyl, and meth in plain sight. The homeless encampments stretch across 50 city blocks and continue to spread. Phil Mateer is a veteran reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle. He's watched the neighborhood descend into chaos. This is the Tenderloin, and what they live here is what residents call the tender life. Only it's not very tender. It's anything but tender. It's sleeping on the streets. It's hard drug use. It's mental illness. And you put it all together, and you add in something in the last couple of years called fentanyl, and you've taken what was a sad mix and made it absolutely toxic and dangerous. How does it work? I think for a lot of people, it's shocking. You have open drug dealing. You have clearly kind of street gangs po positioned at every corner. You have people shooting up in the middle of the street. How can this happen in a major American city? It's an unintended consequence of a lot of things. First of all, we decriminalized the drugs. We made it so that possession of them is no longer a felony. So we thought that that was going to take people easier off the streets. Instead, what it opened up the floodgates for open use. Mental illness, we don't have places to put the mentally ill. And even if we did, there's a political debate about whether you're going to be violating their civil rights if you do put them in an institution. You put all that together and this is what gets built. It wasn't intended, it wasn't sold to the voters this way, but that's what happened. I spoke with dozens of people who fear that homelessness is slowly taking over the city. Since the coronavirus outbreak, the tent encampments have moved beyond the containment zone of the Tenderloin and have established themselves in residential neighborhoods. Erica Sandberg is a writer who's lived in San Francisco for the past 32 years. She's never seen it so bad. It has absolutely exploded. Um, and there are, more, there are more drugs on the street. There's more act, drug activity in terms of sales. Um, the, the tents have completely taken over sidewalks. I've seen a lot of people having sex in public. It didn't necessarily look consensual. I saw a man eat his own vomit out of just complete mental illness. This was something that I saw and I'm thinking, how is this possible that we would just allow somebody in such a state to live on the street because it's his freedom? It's a complete breakdown, a complete breakdown. It's horrific. Are the conversations that you're having with your neighbors, are people, are people talking about leaving? Are people saying, I'm at my breaking point? Are people saying, um, enough is enough, I just give up? Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, it, it is breaking people apart, for sure. I mean, either you've, got, you've got the people who are saying, I'm not leaving. I'm going to, I'm going to stay here and I'm either going to suffer through it or I'm going to fight it. And then you've got the other people say, it's just not worth it. You know, I don't have the bandwidth for this. I don't have the energy, I don't have the money, I don't have, this is too dangerous. It's too depressing. You almost feel like there's no way out of this because it's spreading at such a rapid rate that it's, it's overwhelming. While some families are moving out of San Francisco, there's one demographic that continues to move in, the homeless. According to public records, approximately 50% of the homeless have migrated to San Francisco from outside the city. I, uh, I'm originally from Minnesota, and my family uh, is, is understanding of me being out here. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, 450 chronically homeless individuals migrate to San Francisco every year because the city's become a sanctuary for public camping, drug use, and property crime. Tom Wolf knows this world better than almost anyone. He spent six months on the street as a homeless addict and was arrested six times for drugs and property crime. He's now two years sober, housed, and working for the Salvation Army. But he hasn't forgotten the world of the streets. 
in your experience, living on the streets, being on the streets, working with people on the streets, the folks who are unsheltered homeless in San Francisco, what percentage do you think have a serious drug addiction? This is, again, just empirical evidence yeah. based on me being homeless, 85%. 85%. What does that lifestyle look like? I mean, you have people that have an addiction, they're feeding that addiction with kind of petty crime or a hustle, um, and describe how that economy works. It's an exhausting lifestyle, and it's exhausting because you're hustling all the time, and you're always, whatever you do, your, your primary goal is to maintain your drug addiction, right? So <clears throat> you have people that go out and boost and steal, shoplift. You have people that haul drugs for the dealers. You have people that break into cars, you have a lot of criminal activity that goes around to help supplement whatever services they're already receiving. At the end of our interview, Tom showed me the spot he would sleep on a piece of cardboard and smoke fentanyl. This is my spot. After a half dozen arrests and the threat of a long prison term, Tom finally accepted an offer to go into rehab. He says the police saved his life. If they hadn't created some accountability, he would be dead or in prison. And I just want to, to say that being a drug addict and being homeless is not something that should be criminalized, okay? It's not a crime to be homeless, it's not a crime to be a drug addict, but you do have to own and be responsible for the things that you do in your addiction that are illegal. Just like I, I had to own up to it eventually. But policymakers in San Francisco haven't learned this lesson. Over the past few years, they've allowed homeless encampments throughout the city and significantly reduced enforcement. The movement that we built must continue to grow. It must demand that San Francisco make it easier to get help than it is to get high on our streets. Under the leadership of District Attorney Chesa Boudin, the city has released nearly half of all its prisoners from the county jail and decriminalized tent camping, drug use, prostitution, and public defecation. It must demand that we stop using the jail as the primary place to treat people suffering from mental illness. Boudin's rhetoric sounds good, but in reality, his policies have caused widespread chaos. Hundreds of inmates went directly from the jails to the streets, and the number of homeless encampments in the Tenderloin has increased by 300%. And violence has exploded. In the past 72 hours, eight people have been shot within a few blocks of here. Homelessness uh, has always been uh, a, a major issue. Hillary Ronan is one of the most progressive members of San Francisco's Board of Supervisors. She supported Boudin's agenda of decriminalization, as well as expansion of services and mental health. Five of us supervisors, Supervisor Aaron Peskin, myself. In the past few months, in response to the COVID epidemic, Ronan and other supervisors have pitched a new Hotels for the Homeless plan. The city is leasing thousands of rooms and offering them to the homeless with no preconditions, even offering free drugs and alcohol. This happened in San Francisco when we lured the tech industry here yep. and we, uh, you know, invited them by giving, saying, don't pay taxes. And we had, a we had a housing shortage and didn't take care of that. For Ronan, the homeless are the victims of inequality, racism, and federal housing policy. Like yeah. it or not, we are not these independent, like non-social beings yeah. Yeah. that some that our sort of psychology and 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 and, and constitutional rights yeah. have sort of morphed into in certain parts of this country, um, especially in this Republican ideology, which is really all set up to keep people from having each other's back and keep a certain. Yeah portion of the society ultra rich and, and equality dividing. So that's number one. We need well, I'll, I'll want to stop you there because there's the irony though, because San Francisco is the most unequal city in the United States. You have the Gini coefficient in San Francisco is higher than Nicaragua, higher than the Congo, Nigeria, higher than Nigeria. Yeah, no, no. I, I I I'm not I'm not absolving you know myself or San Francisco of responsibility by any means and we're working on those changes. And this is the tragic irony of San Francisco. The city's leaders denounce inequality around the world, but have created a system of incredible inequality and incredible cruelty. All over San Francisco, there are thousands of men like this, trapped in addiction and psychosis with nowhere to go. The city's poorest families are forced to live in a gauntlet of drug abuse and mental illness. And ultimately, the city's policies are killing people. 
As we wrapped up our final day of shooting, we watched this man die of a fentanyl overdose in a city-sanctioned encampment. This isn't compassion. This isn't justice. People make the assumption that with progressive policy that everybody's gonna do the right thing. And the bottom line is, is not everybody's gonna do the right thing. I think in order for progressive politics to work, you need to have public safety. If our problems could be solved with money, our problems would have been solved a long time ago. So it's not financing, it's not the funding, it's policy. And, until it is a right. and that's the problem. San Francisco's political class refuses to change. So until San Francisco's voters elect new leaders, the city's nightmare will continue. <laughs>